thank you for joining us for this month's edition of The Monthly Blend. The Monthly Blend is a monthly video podcast, which my co-host Anthony Millen and I started last year to explore ideas, concepts, and sort of uh, initiatives that are happening in the DMV region, being the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Virginia. And we've had the honor of interviewing some amazing guests from the Baltimore, Washington region over the last year. And today we have a really awesome program lined up today. We have our topic today is female founders and funders in the DMV, which uh, as most of you know, is a, a very hot topic and an area that really needs a lot of attention. And, um, and we have four of the nation's leading proponents of female founders and funders uh, on with us today. Um, in no particular order, we have Shelly Bell of Black Girl Ventures. We have Natalie Buford Young of Springboard. We have Stephanie Marshall of Citrine Angels and Liz Sarah of Best Marketing and the National Women's Business Council. Uh, welcome, you guys. We really appreciate uh, you guys joining us today. Perhaps uh, you can make some introductions about yourselves and then we'll turn it over to my co-host, Anthony Mellon. Um, so why don't we start with you, Shelley? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I enjoy walks on the beach, uh, <laughs> water aerobics now. Um, so I'm Shelly Bell, founder and CEO of Black Girl Ventures. We work to create access to capital for Black and Brown women founders. We focus on capital, community, and capacity. Um, and with those three things, um, we believe that that's the best way to support underrepresented founders. Uh, one of the things that um, has caused us to stand out is I created our own way of funding women, which includes community. Um, so what happens is, is like Shark Tank meets Kickstarter. So women pitch and then the audience can actually vote with the pitch that they like best with their dollars. And then we grant that capital back out to the founder. I started it in a house in Southeast DC. And now here we are. Uh, this is our fifth year. And we have funded about 264 women. We have, we're stretched across about 12 cities. Uh, we're the largest entrepreneur support organization specifically for black and brown women on the East Coast. Uh, we work with Nike, uh, PayPal, Visa, um, Experian to get the word out education wise, but also to get these founders funded and get them more customers. Um, our founders represent about $10 million in revenue and about 3,000 jobs. Terrific. Welcome to the show. Natalie, how are you today? I'm great, Tian. How are you? Great. So I will uh, just give you a little background. Natalie Buford Young, I'm the CEO of Springboard Enterprises. We're a 21 year old not for profit that is the premier network for women entrepreneurs building their companies to scale. And to date, we've had 835 women come through the program. Out of those, 22 have gone public. 90% of them have received funding. And we've had more than 200 M&A events. And some of the brands that you would recognize would be Zipcar, iRobot, Real Real, Constant Contact, Minute Clinic, Canva. So a lot of great companies have been a part of Springboard. Thank you, Natalie. Welcome. Uh, next, we have Stephanie Marshall, who is... Hey. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm uh, Stephanie Marshall, Katrine Angel's board president and uh, co-founder. And we started in September of 2019, so right before the pandemic, um, mainly because there wasn't an angel group in the D.C. area focused on women investing in women. Um, in my background, um, I was an executive at Verizon and left and started my own consulting company, kind of dug my heels in because I didn't want to move. Um, D.C. is one of the best places for women. Um, we were just, uh, Virginia was just ranked as the top state for business. Um, and part of that is their um, focus on life, health and inclusion. Um, and so we have a really strong area. And I kind of just said, I'm going to dig my heels in. I, I had done some angel and, and LP investing through portfolio, through backstage, um, most recently through uh, the W fund, through Gangels, but none of them <laughs> were in the DC area and no angel group that I had looked at in, were really that inclusive. And so uh, when Allison Redpath started 
was bubbling up the citrine thing. I said, Hey, I want to help. How can I help? And then it was like, Whoa, suck me in. Um, and we've got about, uh, we've had around 50 members or so. We've made about five or six investments. Um, we're over the 300,000 mark. Um, and it's, it's really exciting to be supporting uh, female founders and women entrepreneurs in the area. That's terrific. Well, great job and uh, look forward to learning more. And last but not least is Liz Sarah. Hi, Liz. Hi, Tian. Thanks for having me today. So I'm a former entrepreneur, having started, a, co-founded a software company throughout the decade of the 90s before we exited. I've been doing marketing consulting to tech startups for the last 20 years. I've been involved with the Dingman Center of Entrepreneurship. Um, I know you have as well as board members, and I was a recent chair of that uh, center for a number of years. I've been an angel investor for about 10 years in the DMV. And for the last three years, I've been the chair of the National Women's Business Council, which is actually a small federal agency that has one mission, which is to advocate for women business owners, of which there are 12.5 million in the country. And we represent 40% of all small businesses in the nation. And we support the efforts of female founders. And I've focused our work on three areas for these last three years, access to capital. We all know how important that is at each life cycle phase. Uh, the second pillar is how we get more women focused on starting companies if they have an entrepreneurial aspiration in STEM related areas, instead of the more traditional areas that women tend to start businesses in. And then how do we help female founders in rural communities? Because they don't have the resources and the organizations, just like uh, those of us living in DC and working in the DMV have. So those are the three things that we're focusing on. And we've made various recommendations to Congress and the White House and other federal agencies over the last few years, many of which have been taken up. So I'm excited about that. We've got more to go. Doing great things, Liz. So now I'd like to turn it over to my co-host, Anthony Millen, who's the chair of Next. And maybe, Anthony, you can tell us a little, a little bit about Next also uh, before you uh, kick into the next portion of our show here. Great. Thanks, Tied. So uh, again, um, my name's Anthony. I've been a serial entrepreneur, a partner in a seed stage venture capital fund and the founder and co-chair of Next, which is a new model for delivering legal services to startup and emerging growth companies around the country where we look to bring predictability to legal fees combined with access to senior attorneys and a much more customer-centric, client-centric approach to delivering legal services, leveraging technology and business models that we've brought into place. Um, like Tian, I'm so excited that we have Shelly and Natalie and Liz and Stephanie with us today. And the place that um, I'd like to start off today is looking at the DMV from kind of an investor, you know, how you would describe the investor community marketplace in the DMV today versus a few years ago, how you've seen it grow and change on both a macro level and specifically for female founders. And maybe we'll start with Natalie and then kind of start to work our way. Sure. Sure. I mean, looking at the the bigger picture, and I've been in this market for you know 20 plus years. You know, I'd say even before the pandemic, investors have steadily increased uh, investing outside of their hometowns, which is good for us because we don't have necessarily the critical mass of investors in the DC market. While we have great investors, we don't have you know an abundance um, as you would in Silicon Valley or New York or Boston or other markets. Um, so that is great news for us. Um, it's because they're investing outside of their hometown. We've had an increased flow of capital. Um, that's great. COVID really impacted, um, I, I would say, all investors, making sure that they're not just looking in their own backyard. Um, it forced a, a new level of being virtual and, and you know, tapping their networks to uh, look for companies outside of their, their hometowns. Uh, that being said, for women, it's still the same story, which is not necessarily a good one. Um, women continue to receive only a fraction of venture capital from 2019 to 2020. The venture capital 
flowing to women founded companies dropped from 2.9% to 2.3%. I don't think DC is any different than the rest of the country in that aspect. Um, you know, a couple of those factors are, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of women are the, the primary caregivers in their households. So they had to make the decisions on, you know, are we going to scale our company and raise capital or do we press the pause button and take care of what's at hand. So that's a, you know, that's a unique factor to a lot of women. And then the second is investors, you know, faced with market uncertainty and um, really just kind of reverted back to what's more comfortable. They can, you know, reverted back to their comfortable networks and were less willing to take a risk, um, which was a detriment to any, you know, women founders or other diverse founders. So that's were, where you, we are. were you seeing similar things, Shelley? You know, what what um, what have you seen over the last several years in the, in this region? Oh, you know, <laughs> money does not move fast here, right? So let's just give a little bit of context on uh, the coasts, right? So uh, on the, you know, West Coast, where we have, you know, Silicon Valley, even the Bay and, you know, San Francisco, there's a lot more movement around how they invest. They, they, uh, they, they can vet a little different in terms of like uh, some of the initial conversations and they tend to move a little bit more risky, at least it, it appears to others, right? Um, and they, they tend to make some, some bets in the direction that they feel like they have the best networks. Uh, what I've seen on the East Coast in general is that investments move a lot slower um, and that, you know, there's a lot more. The vetting is a little bit deeper. It's a little bit more conservative. I will say, like, seeing the interest from women in general to start angel groups like Citrine, um, seeing like an incubator like Halcyon, um, which is over in Georgetown, like start a their own angel group. So I have seen. Um, some movement, you know, even portfolio, which uh, Stephanie mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, started to launch here and work with women here. Uh, we're seeing uh, things like 1863 invested in founders and also like getting these larger partnerships with like a target and getting people thinking about supply diversity. So when I think about the flow of like access to capital and then you have um, what Sarah Chin um, and Shelly Porges were doing with the uh, with the billion dollar commitment from um, these different uh, investors. So I think there is an urge and a nudge and a movement to say we need to do something. And then people are taking it, uh, you know, and putting the energy behind doing something. I think historically it's just been a little slower and it's been focused on biomedical and uh, focused on some um, like government tech um, types of things. I'm hopeful. I'm a serial optimist. I have to be. So um, I'm hopeful that, you know, like I said, with, with what Satrine is doing, with what Halcyon is doing, that we're going to see a lot more things move um, in a different direction locally. Great. No, it's exciting to see these um, new vehicles and entities and, and groups coming together. Liz, you've, you've spent a long time in this ecosystem as an entrepreneur and an investor and guiding a lot of early stage companies. What have you seen and kind of what do you, what do you see coming up in, in this part of the ecosystem, again, particularly for female founders? So, Anthony, I've seen two major changes over, say, the last decade. One is in the types of investors who are angels. Back when I first started, I'd be in an angel group of, let's say, 30 investors, and there'd be three of us that were women doing the investing. Fast forward to today, those same groups maybe have six or eight women out of the 30. So yes, we've made some headway, but not enough if you think about the length of time. Um, it's it's delightful to see groups that are springing up that are focused on helping women founders that with by other women investors. So the makeup has changed. The second thing that I see is a big change in the types of companies that are getting founded in the DMV. Again, 10 years ago, 
most of the companies that we were seeing were software SaaS of one type or another. So very much a technology uh, backbone to what was being created. What we're seeing today is more of a variety. We're seeing everything from new beverages to new food, to new fashion, to new ways of doing uh, activities for the home as well as for the family and the business. So not just tech. And that's unusual for this area because we've been such a government focused, technology focused region which is how we started off with the tech entrepreneurial ecosystem that we had in place. But it is broadening and it is expanding. And as we're seeing exits in some of these newer types of companies that are not tech, and we're getting those former founders and and management teams involved in supporting the ecosystem, either through becoming angels or becoming mentors or setting up their own groups themselves, that will speed up the diversity that we have in both the kinds of investors as well as the kinds of companies we're supporting. Yeah, I um, agree with the drive forward in this in this region, and um, you know, again, just coming back to what what each of you are doing and the important role that you're each playing. In, in moving this forward and setting an example for the region, I think is fantastic. Um, Stephanie, what, what are you seeing kind of through the work that you're doing? Well, I mean, Citrine uh, was focused on trying to draw more funders in, right? There's so many successful women in this area and they haven't educated about this asset class, right? There's a lot of myths around angel investing, right? You've got to be this exited founder, you know, and you have to be funded, first of all. So 2% it doesn't really exactly help us in that area. And, you know, it's the old, no offense, but old white guy network. And, you know, even, even a lot of the angel groups that I looked at were mostly men, older, you know, maybe the successful exit person. He was like, I'm only going to invest in people that I can meet face to face. And I like to um, bust through those types of um I think in some ways it's a little bit of nonsense. And so, uh, you know, we, when we started Citrine, our goal was to be very accessible and to educate women on, Hey, did you even know that you're an accredited investor? Did you know that you could actually do this and that you don't have to have a hundred grand or 200 grand or 2 million to make an angel investment and to make it much more accessible and open and inclusive and, and not scary. Right. And so creating a safe place where women can learn okay, how do I write my first check? And we have a good mix of experienced angels and and new angels, people who haven't written a check ever. Um, And we also purposely did not put a minimum in place um, to make it accessible. So some angel groups are like, oh, it's a minimum of 25 per year or 50 or whatever it may be. Um, And we decided to purposefully say, no minimum, come in, let's learn about this, let's do it. And let's start supporting and changing that, you know, pitiful 2% number. So if I could add one thing to uh, Stephanie's comments, because it's, it's, it's really important on a lot of levels. You know, we look at through the Women's Business Council, a lot of the business survey data that the census collects on how many businesses are women owned versus men owned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and which industries they're in. We don't have enough female founders in the types of industries that venture capital put their money into. And until we increase that, we're always going to be lagging because it is such a small percentage. When when I mentioned that there are 12.5 million women-owned businesses in the country, 90% of those, most people don't know this number, 90% of the 12.5 million have zero employees. And they're not the kinds of companies that are scalable. They're yoga instructors, they're graphic designers that do freelance work, kitchen table kinds of companies, neighborhood types of companies. They, I'm not criticizing them, but I'm saying these are not what venture capital investors put money into. So until we can encourage women to kind of step outside perhaps a little bit of a comfort zone and look at companies that are investable, you know, 
where does the money flow? Then we're going to start seeing some changes in where those VC dollars go. So we're in this kind of chicken and egg thing because the kinds of companies that the data say that women invest, uh, women start are not venture backable kinds of companies, but we need to change. And yet they can't get the money to start the ones maybe that they want to, right? They're like, yeah. But, you know, uh, I hear you 100% and I, and I don't, you know, fully disagree. However, and so I'll give it a yes and. Um, I do also do not want to have the conversation as if the women are the problem, right? So I think mm-hmm. that like, there's also a place where, you know, on, on one hand you're told, oh, you got you got a restaurant? That's not, that's not venture backable. We're not doing that. We don't invest. And then next thing you know, you get an announcement that says that X, Y, and Z restaurant received X amount uh-huh. of venture. Yeah. So what is venture backable is not about the company. It is about the process. And that is the part that is missing from the conversation with women is that it's like, oh, it's the kind of company. No, no, it's not about the kind of company. Have you developed a scalable process behind your company that can then have low overhead and go in and be used by millions of people? I think there's another piece around like, well, if we're just going to wait into women or we if we're attempting to urge more women, yes, should start some companies. And if you don't, you should still be receiving investments. We should still figure out, like, what does that mean? Of course, if you just think solo founder that just wants to own a studio and that's it, then that then that's what you want to do. There are some founders, though, that are like, no, I want to own a chain of, of studios, and here's my process, like a soul cycle. It, you know, on onset, you would look at soul cycle and be like, oh, that's just a... This, you know, that's just a cycling studio. Nobody's going to invest in that. And then we found that's not true. So I also believe there's a narrative challenge here where the narrative that we're giving to women versus boys versus girls, women versus men about what you can do, what can happen, how much funding you can receive and who will fund it needs to shift. And we need to press the people with capital to think different, too. So I think it's a yes and I do agree that women, you know, it'd be great if more people started more companies in different ways, but it'd also be great if investments work differently because clearly they're making money. <laughs> so if it's about, yeah, you're right. You know, and, and I think, you know, to Stephanie's point about the kind of mission of Citrine, which is to bring brand new, never before investors to the table to make them think of themselves as an investor. There was a bill that was introduced in Congress year before last that as the Women's Business Council, we worked with them on the language and fully support it and hope that they actually take it up. And that is to provide a federal tax credit to anyone who invests in any startup. I wanted it to be just for anyone who invests in a woman-owned startup, but was told, no, we can't have legislation geared to one gender or another. That's fine. But in every community, if you think about outside the major metropolitan areas, you have the wealthy doctors, the wealthy attorneys, the wealthy car dealership owners, et cetera. They don't think of themselves as angel investors, but they are the very people who can support the small businesses in their community. They can support that yoga studio so that she who owns it can open up a second one or a third one. And so with this legislation, if we can get Congress to address it at some point soon and maybe pass it, it will bring more investors to the table. And that's what we need. People who will invest in their neighborhood because that's where it starts and that's where that's where the seedlings begin to take hold. And I think that that will help to change the narrative and the opportunity. So we, we need to bring angel investing and funding out into the rest of the country, not just the big urban centers as well. So it's totally like the, the whole rise of the rest concept is, is huge. So if, you know, if you kind of look at, at, in addition to the, that funding, what would be some of the additional steps that you would take? So as you look back five years from now, looking backwards, what are some of the other types of things like expanding the base of, of angel investors who can invest and look to uh, 
kind of market this region and entrepreneurs in this region to other ecosystems around the country for both talent and capital. What would be, given the, the different strengths you see in this region, some of the other things that we can do to drive that forward and change, you know, even faster the where we're going to be five years from now? I think it's connections across, right? So like one of the things that I feel like in DC is that we're little small pockets and we don't always connect and talk to each other. And I think, you know, one of the things that Citrine has been doing is just reaching out to as many different groups as we possibly can and starting to build those relationships and make those connections so that you can syndicate the deals. Because we're small, right? We're never going to lead. I mean, knock on wood, not yet. But we're not leading rounds. And we're, you know, we're tiny so far. And, you know, we need to partner with other folks to to really have an impact. Um, and then, you know, another thing that I, you know, as somebody who has worked internationally and nationally, D.C. is not the only place, right? So make the connections in New York, make the connections in Silicon Valley and be out there. Don't just, you know, put our heads down and go, oh, DMV is the greatest. And, you know, we, we've got to build the connections all over the place and be that some sort of connective thread to, to drive change, I think. And I think we need to bring more women who uh, may not have been founders of a company, but have worked yeah. successfully in bigger companies that have yeah. a lot of skills that transfer to a startup founder in building his or her company. We need more female mentors. When we look at the mentor networks that are in place through some of the university entrepreneurship centers, even through some of the incubators we don't have enough women. And women have this perception that, well, I've never started a company and grown it and sold it, so I can't be a mentor. Not true. I mean, women benefit greatly by seeing themselves personified by somebody else who's done something in a very successful way. So we need to encourage through all of our networks for women to get involved. You may not be able to write a check as an investor, but you surely can help a woman uh, in, in terms of helping her with her business challenges, because we all know how great those are and, and how varied those are too. I love, yeah, true. I agree. I would, I would love to see more headquarters here. You know, I would love to see more women headquartered here, even if they are getting investment from other places. Um, I would love to see them building their companies here, hiring a talent here. Um, and that could be a really awesome evolution for economic development locally and could be empowering for, you know, surrounding counties and women who are already starting to see people actually moving their headquarters here. Um, and I believe that D.C. Gov has done some things to incentivize that. And it'd be awesome to see Virginia incentivizing that to see, you know, um, to see Maryland incentivizing that to have people come outside of the larger corporations like your Amazon and things like that. It'd be awesome to incentivize uh, small businesses owned by women, venture backable or scalable companies owned by women moving and saying, oh, no, I'm going to headquarters. I'm going to have my headquarters in D.C. or in the DMV. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're great for women, right? We're great yeah. for women and we're great for innovation. Yeah. And Shelly, to your point, I mean, there are sorry, some great right incentives. Um, I know in the state of Virginia, one of the investments that I made in a startup filed whatever paperwork, and I don't have all the details on it, but there are certain documents that you can file at a startup founder so that when you exit, your investors do not have to pay capital gains on hopefully a very large, you know, uh, turnout, a very large payout. And so we need every state to do that. We need DC to do that. Maryland used to do it for certain kinds of investments in biotech companies. But if we make it easier for people to invest in different kinds of companies, at least to create more of a groundswell of incubation in, these, in this tri-state area. I think that will go a long way to encouraging more people to come here or start their company here. Or if they graduate from college, they don't go back home to another state. They stay here and do it. Now, Lee, uh, before we end the segment, what are some of your thoughts as to things that you think we could be doing now and over the next, you know, 12 to 24 months to really help change things three or four years from now in some of these areas? 
Yeah, I mean, I uh, along with what everybody else has said, I mean, if we think back or, or even looking at now, um, I, I think the DC metro area does a really nice job with all of the economic development authorities and organizations. So there's a lot of incentives for companies to build their businesses here. You know, when I think for those of us that have been around a little bit longer in the market, you know, markets really take off as a, you know, a critical business hub when they have clusters of companies that all kind of succeed at the same time. So think back to, you know, the AOLs or the Blackboards that all spawned other businesses. And then we all kind of gathered around and and broke pieces of those off or, you know, groups of people left and started other companies. And we're kind of seeing that a little bit right now with Amazon that's spawning some cottage industry type companies that are starting to scale. So I think that's kind of our next wave. But, you know, I think what what makes us successful is, you know, let's focus on making these companies that we have here in our own backyard highly successful because growing those is what brings talent in from the outside, brings the lens of outside investors to focus on greater Washington. And then, of course, gives us the ability to uh, spin off additional companies. So I'd say, you know, let's make our local companies wildly successful. Great. Well, thank you. That was, you know, really um, very helpful to give more of a macro picture around the DMV startup ecosystem from talent and funding and capital and investing. And uh, now we're going to switch back over to TN. And um, I hand it over to you, TN. Thanks, Anthony. And thank you, uh, Liz, Stephanie, Shelley, and Natalie for your thoughts. I think you set the table for a deeper discussion for sure. And theoretically, right, we know that we need to build an ecosystem. We need exited founders. We need uh, role models. We need capital, both angel as well as institutional. So uh, on that topic, I'd like to start with Natalie, because Natalie, you you know, you, you come from Deloitte. You come from uh, a large company. You've seen a lot regionally and also just nationally with respect to early stage tech and investment. Um, how, you know, do you guys have any, and, and Springboard also has been around uh, for a very long time. You guys are definitely pioneers in the movement. And, uh, and I applaud you guys for that. And I think they selected an amazing uh, CEO in you. Do you guys have any statistics, whether it's anecdotal or empirical regarding the investment returns for either super angels or venture capitals of female founded ventures or diverse founder uh, team ventures versus all male ventures. I'm just thinking, you know, uh, if I'm an LP in a fund or if I'm a venture capitalist, and this is like the hottest thing right now is to put money to work with underserved entrepreneurs. It would be awesome if I could say, hey, look, this particular segment of founders has outperformed the traditional all-male uh, founder group. How do you conduct research to, um, to, to kind of I do, prove and this Thanks out? for giving me time to, to find my little notes on it. Um, <laughs> studies do show that companies with a woman founder perform 63% better than investments in all-male founded teams. And businesses founded well, by are women. We publicizing that information. That's critically well, we important. Right now. We it are. is. It's out there. Just, it, it is out, out there. there. People it's use it. It's we're not about the numbers. And over. Yep. <laughs> so and, and I'll add businesses founded by women deliver twice as much per dollar invested than those founded by men. So we just have to keep beating the drum. We have to keep having these conversations and then soon it will be on the tip of people's tongues, but it takes repetition and understanding and continued publishing for people to get it. So, and it's, and quite frankly, it is hard to find those stats. It is not prevalent enough. And that's something that we're doing at Springboard is saying, let's bring this to the forefront. Let's continue to prove it out. You know, and part of ours, you know, Springboard women do better than non-Springboard women women do better than men. Like there's a lot of stats that, that need to be out there. So we'll continue to, to focus there. Yeah. I mean, that kind of data is super important. And I mean, Liz, you have a national platform. I mean, you have the ear of the white house, right? You have the ear of the policymakers in this country. 
um, regardless of administration, left or right side of the aisle, I think everyone agrees that creation of jobs is a, a function of um, successful startup companies, right? And if it's a, a woman-owned startup that's going to outperform other types of startups, uh, that could be, you know, a logical argument, right? So how are your conversations going with our policymakers and what do you see for the next, is it, you know, you, you mentioned some legislation, which is awesome, you know, to drive incentives, but what other types of policies are you guys promoting? So one in particular is called the first employee tax credit. So as I said, 90% of all women owned businesses have no employees. So how do we help them, you know, bite the bullet to get that first full-time employee where you're writing a check every two weeks, whether you're making that revenue or not, very scary proposition for a lot of founders, a lot of women who have been in the business by themselves all along. So there's another piece of legislation that's been introduced that we're hoping will get uh, discussed and, and voted on, but it will make it that much easier to get that first employee on board uh, by alleviating lots of taxes and payroll taxes associated with that. So that's just one step. And I think what's really important in the conversations that we as a council have with members of the Senate Small Business Committee, the House Small Business Committee, is that there is widespread nonpartisan support for job creation and small businesses. And as a nonpartisan council um, that changes, uh, you know, flavor and direction with each new administration, it's just been really important that our advocacy role is really focused exclusively on how do we help women founders in general? And, you know, these are some of the things that we've been working on. And, and just this year, some of our recommendations are gonna focus on those women that have companies that do federal government contracting. And those of us in this marketplace know what a big market the federal government is. And if we can find ways to make it easier for small women owned businesses to get those job uh, opportunities, those RFP opportunities, much more than they have been to date, that's gonna help elevate them and help their growth that much faster and help women play at that federal government level in terms of a, a business focus that we don't have much representation at thus far. Yeah, because I think that's a great top-down approach, right? So. Uh as opposed to say Shelly, who's doing more of a bottom up approach, but Shelly, you have a really tough task. I mean, you know, not only are you trying to support uh, female entrepreneurs, but black female entrepreneurs, which is, you know, I think even more rare when you talk about role models and trying to find great role models. Um, you know, how are you going about that? And you said something interesting in your opening remarks, which is that you've gotten some corporate sponsorship or corporate participation, which I'm sure Natalie and, and Stephanie are also, um, you know, beating the bushes for. But um, talk about your your efforts with, you know, getting corporate support, whether it's out of a community pocket, but you see um, Zeal Ventures just raised money from PayPal and from some other corporate um, LPs. I think he raised 50 million, uh, Nasir, who you guys know. Um, and, and that's, I was so happy to see that because, um, you know, he's a former speaker at Connectpreneur and just dynamo, you know, it, it's, and to raise 50 million for your first fund like that, just incredible, right? So, you know, and he's a good role model for you, I assume, and also for Stephanie in a way, right? So, um, you know, how do you, how do you get women role model? And it doesn't have to be a Sheila Johnson, you know, it could be, much, you know, much smaller, successful black female entrepreneur, but how do you do that? And then how are you approaching the, uh, the corporate venture um, funders? Yeah, uh, great questions. I mean, I think that the top-down approach, there's it, the, our challenge is cultural. <laughs> okay, we like the challenge is not about women. Everything, all the numbers say women make you more money and they save you money. Yeah. Everything says that even women on boards, women in executive committees, committees, it's a better company. Diverse yeah. found like the numbers are there to justify all the reasons that have been said about why it's not happening. Um, and that that is from a government level to a, you know, a corporate level to a, you know, private equity level. 
Like all of these things have been said and, and are known, right? So, oh, sorry, my dog is barking. Um, so ultimately, uh, the one of our challenges is cultural and that it's so it's such a big challenge that it's hard to address. Right. So it's hard to chip away at the cultural things that are wrong. So it's better to chip away at the things that are quantitative. And so we focus on those first. And then we're, we're kind of running into a wall because we're throwing out a quantitative and we say, OK, hey, these numbers prove that we need this thing and it's just not happening. And a lot of times our government doesn't move unless it's an emergency. So there's a change takes a long time and, and loving the work that that Liz is doing to push that at a policy level. But top down and top down is not the way that change happens, at least in, in some of our communities. So what 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 we're seeing is that when we talk about like payroll taxes and some of the things that feel like a luxury to think about to communities who may be starting uh, businesses out of need, right? Like think about the pandemic. We are no longer um, in a place to be able to actually, as much as we want to separate who's a contractor and who is an employee. Um, And so some things I'm working on putting together from a policy standpoint is how do we define work and how do we define jobs? Because right now we need capital infused into homes. Right. So. So, yeah, it was great. You know, two years ago, we could like focus on like jobs and you got it. But then when the PPP came out, we knew we found out that the way we handle our our citizens is not nuanced enough for everybody or every business that exists. And if we're going to truly build policy and create uh, avenues for access to capital, then we're hunting, we're going to have to get a little bit more nuanced than we want to. And so. In my community, the conversations that we're having about staying afloat are about how you build capital, earn capital, and then hire contractors that can help you get more capital. Public-private partnerships have been significant in my journey and what it means for, like, we have a small business ice cream company who is across multiple stores, Walmart, uh, Whole Foods across the country and we did a program with them where the proceeds from the ice cream become a grant to actually uh provide access to design web design and ip for small women business owners those types of things they are not held up by policies they're not held up by they're just decisions that we that these corporations and companies can make. Our partnership with Nike is a half a million. Our partnership with Visa um, is ongoing. Our partnership with uh, Kroger is a half a million to affect change in local communities across the country. And so public-private partnerships are key to this. And I think us being in the DMV, um, I feel a little bit more responsible for that because we have so many corporations here. And, the go- and, and we have the government here. So I think that if we're going to think about innovation, it can't just be the companies being started. It has to be the way that we fund as well. Procurement challenges, supplier diversity. Like these are the things that I'm hammering away at because this is where they affect my community deeply. Um, because if you got the money, you don't mind paying the payroll taxes. Yeah, I mean, I mean and I'm well, saying it's it, amazing it, how, how many multiple challenges you have. You have to do take a holistic view, given the various challenges and biases that we're facing or that your community is facing. So I really applaud that. I mean, it's um, it's amazing, actually. So, yeah, I mean, that that's really terrific. Um, Stephanie, so you guys started a venture fund uh, or an angel fund. Angel group. It's not it, a fund. It, oh, not so a it's, an angel, it's an angel five, group. Okay. You guys started 501c6. 501 okay, C6, got it. Public Benefit Corp. Thanks. We, thanks everybody for that. Everybody makes their own, own, own investment decisions. <laughs> got it. Okay. But um, what I was going to say is you guys started Citrine Angels right before the pandemic hit. I mean, yes. you talk about yes. like crazy time to start any kind of business. And mm-hmm. then you wound up doing a half a dozen deals, which is super impressive. Yeah. We, we did 250 in our first six months. That's awesome. I mean, what, how do you see things moving, looking over the next, say, 24 months for you all? Are you trying to get more, uh, more investors involved? Are you, uh, you know, how are you getting deal flow? You said you don't lead deals, but you know, how do you, Mm -hmm. how do you 
ensure that you're, you know, putting the money to work in places that you really are targeting? Yeah, we're, we're uh, you know, we spent a lot of time, like I said, building those relationships and building awareness that we exist. And, you know, we've grown really pretty organically, um, but we are pushing to, you know, do things like this. We've, you know, uh, we, uh, I know I'm involved in a p- bunch of different angel groups, not angel groups, but angel groups and funds. Um, I've been in the startup scene national, nationally across the country. And so just building those um, relationships helps us. Um, if they know about us, they send us deal flow. Um, so we've increased our deal flow substantially over the last um, even just six months. Um, and so we've been seeing really, really, really good deal flow. And we've had to make some tough decisions about who to bring in to pitch. Um, and we've had quite a few that are, you know, I think we have two companies going through diligence right now from our um, from our spring funding cycle. Um, and I, I do see it improving. We absolutely want more members, right? The more women that we have um, involved with Citrine, it's such a low price. Like it's, it's even lower than any angel group in the area or probably nationally. Um, it, it's just such a low point of entry and there's education and awareness that, that comes and support, right? Like being in the room and hearing how other people are evaluating deals and getting that, that diversity of perspectives. Yes, we're all women, but you have, we have like doctors, lawyers, business people, consultants, you know, people with CPG, right? We've had quite a few ice cream companies come through and, you know, one of our, uh, our members has experience in that area that I would have never been able to to evaluate that kind of deal and um and so i think having more women that are interested in learning about investing and actually writing checks is really critical to our success because that will drive the deal flow that will drive dollars and reinvestment and so that's one of the uh, the biggest focus of us for this year is, is really on on membership and driving new new members well that's awesome well I'm, hopefully i can make some interest for you as well yeah you guys are doing some really important work. I mean, we're almost out of time, but do you guys have any questions for each other? I know you all know what each other. Doing. <laughs> I, I'll help in any way I can. Deal flow, investment, you know, whatever I can I do. do. I have a question. Um, and yeah, same, same, Stephanie. Um, is I am wondering, uh, Citrine is a little bit new. Black Revenge is only five years old. Um, Liz and Natalie have been around for a while. And so I'm interested in where do you view the innovation uh, needing to happen in the way that we even serve women? Like, I think that like, um, yeah, I just, I have questions about it. Like, or, or, or is that a thought at all? Like about like, how we serve founders in general, like, um, are we over edu- doing the education piece and kind of mm-hmm. under doing the technical assistance? No, I, th- I think, and I just had a conversation this week with the, the new executive director of the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship. Many of you know about NIFTY. So they're a national organization okay. and they do entrepreneurship programs in inner city schools. So they go to students that are at risk and may not have other options, may not think of themselves as a founder of a potential company. And I've been involved with this group for a number of years. And let me tell you, it is so inspiring and heartwarming to see nine-year-olds pitch their company. And in many cases, they have little businesses up and running. So I think the work of groups like Nifty and others that have a regional approach around the country is so important because entrepreneurship doesn't start when you're in college. You know, it starts with the culture awareness that's put in front of you from your family. And if your family isn't doing it, then the schools. And if the schools themselves aren't doing it, then it's nonprofit groups like Nifty and others that are showing young kids a different path of a career for themselves. And I think the more that we touch youngsters at the K through 12 emphasis on the lower grades, I think the more entrepreneurship and innovation we're going to see blossom. I think it may be on the latter end, though, of like the change we're trying to make is what I was more referring to. 
And Natalie, I think that's what you were going to speak to. So yeah, more like I, if we're talking about women starting business now, getting investment, exiting, proving, you know, to the market that women investments are viable. I'm talking about on that end. You have the, you know, entrepreneurs going from right. incubator to incubator, you know, uh, all these different training programs. But I'm wondering, is there more to do? Yeah, I mean, there definitely is more to do. And there's, you know, every time you have an entrepreneur or a woman entrepreneur coming through the, you know, the life cycle, um, we've got to continue to educate them. And, you know, I, one of our programs today, we've got an ongoing cohort active right now um, on uh, health innovation. And our workshop today was a finance workshop. And it was the basic blocking and tackling from everything what is your, you know, what is a cap table? Who's on your cap table? Who should be on your cap table? What are, why should you have a clean cap table? How will that impact you during the, the, you know, the venture capital investment process? So, you know, I think we have this assumption that we have to kind of fake it and we shouldn't have to do that. We need safe spaces to really get educated and really have people that are going to support us. So, you know, that's, that's really a main focus of Springboard is saying, you know, once you're post seed or you're, you know, angel investing stage and you're approaching your series A or series, or you've reached your series A, that is go time. And you can't miss all of those important things that you need to know. So whether it's, you know, raising your next round, having a clean cap table, making sure that you've got the right go to market strategy, making sure that, you know, if you're in the life sciences based, you know, not everyone knows how to go through the FDA approval process. I'm sorry, it's not just an innate thing. So, you know, we, we bring them through those stages and attach um, key advisors that are very specific to okay. the gaps that they're trying to, um, to fill or the objectives that they're trying to overcome. So it's, it's about connections. It's about relationships. It's about, you know, leveraging all of the resources that we have to get there faster and not have to reinvent the wheel. And financial literacy is so key. A lot of the data that we've seen through the National Women's Business Council points to so many of these female founders not having the, the necessary understanding of mm -hmm. what's a balance sheet, what is an income statement, what are my quarterly financials, am I at budget, below budget, ahead of budget? And so, you know, there are lots of free programs out there in the market, and we need to encourage those organizations that have them from the big banks and the global banks to reach out into their community and make those programs available. And until they do that, you know, they're actually helping their own business because the more financially educated they can make those who are not the bigger the universe of potential customers that they can, uh, you know, tap into. But financial literacy is absolutely an area that women can benefit by getting a little bit more knowledge in. And I think supporting, right? I think, you know, going back to the connections is don't make someone feel stupid for asking a question, right? Like if we really want to help, then tell, like provide the support of saying, hey, look, not everybody knows what a cap table is. Here's what it is. Here's how you, you know, I'll help you set it up, right? And so getting those advisors and the mentors, Natalie, that you, um, you know, uh, talked about or, or Shelly that, you know, look, or I think maybe Liz, like women that have been in corporations, right? Like we know some of the, maybe not the cap table thing, but we know the finance, we know the business case, we know how to go to market, you know, all of those things where we can support and do it in such a consultation, a consultative way and, and just help them rise up, give them more visibility, make the connection. Don't just say, oh, here is an intro. Encourage, like, right. take, you know, like it's the same thing with women in, in corporations. Don't mentor, sponsor, sponsor. Mm -hmm. Yep, totally. That should be the theme right there. Don't mentor, sponsor. Yep. <laughs> yes right. to that. Right. Right. With money, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, thank you guys so much. That might be the title for this podcast. We'll see. <laughs> um, there you go. Yeah. And uh, before I turn it back over to Anthony, I want to thank you, Liz, Natalie, Shelly, and Stephanie. You guys are fantastic. And I want to congratulate you guys for uh, doing the great work you guys are doing. And we're here to support and help. And I know our viewers and listeners are as well. And for those of you out there, uh, if you have not yet 
registered on our website. It's www.themonthlyblend.com and sign up and then you'll get all the latest updates and episodes. So thank you guys for listening. I'll turn over to Anthony. Anthony. Great. So uh, before we end first, I just wanted to say again, thank you to Natalie, Shelley, Liz, and Stephanie for all of your insight and a tr really interesting and informative conversation today. And to thank you for all of your leadership and, and, and all the work that you do to support and drive forward um, female founders in, in our area. Um, and so for anyone who's interested in learning more about your organizations or who are interested in getting involved or supporting the, the work that you're doing in any way, um, you know, we'll start with Stephanie, just how, how can people learn more about what you're doing or reach you? Sure. So I would say there's, there's a couple ways. One, follow us on LinkedIn. That is our best, you know, ex, you know, how we get out information about our events. And some of them are open to anyone, um, some of our education and social events. Um, the website is citrineangels.com. And if anyone has questions, they can email info at citrineangels.com and we'd be happy to, to answer. Oh, we also have office hours twice a month. So you can come and Fantastic. Thank you, Stephanie. Liz? Uh, I would encourage anyone to sign up to get on the mailing list of the National Women's Business Council. We'd love to invite you to our roundtables where we tackle some of these issues and, and you know, reach out to the community for your suggestions. So it's nwbc.gov. And I would also encourage anyone to connect with me on LinkedIn because I'm very often posting information about what we're doing and what we're recommending and, you know, what we're talking about. Great. Thanks, Liz. Shelley? Oh, Stephanie, I didn't know you had office hours set twice a month. We're going to have to connect on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, you can reach us at blackgirlventures.org. You can also, uh, we're having on Instagram, so at blackgirlventures on Instagram. We also have a nice LinkedIn following as well, so you can look us up there. Great. And Natalie? All right. Same. Uh, Natalie, you can, you can, Reach me directly at natalie at springboardenterprises.org. You can check out our website, springboardenterprises.org. Follow us on LinkedIn. Follow me on LinkedIn. Um, you can join us for one of our upcoming pitch events. We call them dolphin tanks. They're a friendlier shark tank. That's how we connect uh, investors and entrepreneurs and others, other advisors that want to support them. And the upcoming one, uh, depending on when this is airing, the most appropriate, I think, is August 4th. And that one is going to be showcasing black and brown founders, uh, women founders who are building companies focused on the future of e-commerce and retail. So join us for that. We also have our current application period open for our digital health cohort. So lots of ways to connect with us. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to all our viewers for um, joining us for today's great show. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank Thanks you again. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys so much.